Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, good to see y'all. I'm glad to be back. I have my voice a little hoarse. It's just because we were screaming and yelling all week with the youth camp. We had a good time. Uh, anything that could go wrong went wrong on the way back, uh, but I want to thank the church. We made a couple of phone calls, and church members came to get us from a couple different parts of the state. The vehicles broke down, and uh, the pickle broke down the first two or three days into camp. Where, where is Cammy? I don't know. What? Wednesday. Wednesday. So then I was shuttling people with my truck and the bus, and then on the way back, the bus broke down, and uh, a couple of people had to run to different parts of the state to pick up the youth. Thank you all. Uh, it's good to know that I only had to make a couple phone calls, and everybody was willing to jump at the chance. We didn't have anything to worry about. Hope and I and Cammie and uh, Brian got back safe with all the youth, so that was a blessing. I think we had a great time. You'll hear more about it later on in the week, but uh, I mean next week. But we do have a video we're going to share, just one video this morning. Uh, and by the way, right after you picked up Jenny, you guys got in an accident, right? I hope you're all all right anyway. I hope that you are. Jet, I asked Jet if being in an accident had anything to do with Little Red. He said no. Yeah, that's good. But, and did it total in your car? Just mess it up bad or, or what? Mess it up pretty bad. I'm sorry. Right there at the intersection. Thank you. Uh, announcements. Read your bulletin. You see the one about the baby shower for Caitlin and AJ. Um, she's also on the prayer list as of now. If you pray for her, just... I don't know what it's like to be expecting. I have no idea. I've seen Kathy go through it. She's got issues going on. I told AJ when he married her she had issues, but now she's got medical issues. So uh, pray for her. I don't know everything that's happening. You can talk to her if you want. I don't want to get into all that. Evan Hayes, Lillian Blackman, uh, Ricky and Judy Nance. Judy is um, uh, Miss Jeannie's younger, not the youngest, younger sister, and her husband, Ricky has a heart aneurysm. They just found out a couple of days after we did the funeral service for Miss Jeannie, so they're pretty upset about that. Uh, Alan Oxendine plays ball and got hit in the, here, uh -huh. you said, eyebrow and broke some bones in his face, so if you pray for him. And also pray for all the youth and the workers. Uh, the workers that they'll recover and the youth, that they won't uh, forget what they learned. They had a wonderful week, they really did. Anybody else have a prayer request or an announcement that we need to emphasize? I did want to grab, I didn't grab the bag. All right, the nominating committee, fill out the little blue form. Right, show, Alfie, show them that blue form. When I say it, they may not know. But fill out that blue form if you haven't already. If you don't want me to pull it out, you just walk down here. Okay. And be specific. If there's a gift that you have and you just feel like you want to be a part of something uh, and it's not listed, write it down. Tell us what you'd like to do and we'll try to fit you in somewhere, okay? Uh, the Operation Christmas Child, the shoe boxes, the bags are back there. Grab those and fill those out. I know they've got directions for you. All right, anybody else, uh, an announcement or a prayer request? All right, all announced up. All right, so after I have a word of prayer, what's next? I don't want to run. Video? Huh? You want to do the video? You want to do the video now? Let me, let me pray, then do that video, okay? All right, yeah, I, listen, this is Claire Stroud in the video. Her nickname is Crash because she's constantly hurting herself. And I tried to break her legs and arms, I think, when we did this video. So let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. I do want to thank you for giving us a good week. For everybody who was gone at youth camp for bringing us back safely. Uh, no serious injuries, and everybody seemed to have a great time. Lord, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word and for giving us a chance to be together to fellowship here this morning. Uh, bless this time that we have. We do live in a wicked world, a cruel world. And, uh, you tell us that while we're in this world, death is a reality. You never know what's gonna happen to us physically 
And I pray, Lord, we would trust you. When we have chances like this to come together, to worship you, to be together with brothers and sisters in Christ, let us cherish these moments. Every time that we have it, God, let us appreciate the fact that we have the freedom to do it. I thank you again for what you've done for us, and we lift up those that are on our prayer list. You know how serious some needs are, and uh, there's some who have needs and not going to call out, and that's fine. You understand what's going on in their hearts. I've had several contacts this week, even while I was at camp, of people who are having a difficult time. So God bless them with healing, emotionally, spiritually, physically, whatever they need. Again, thank you for this chance to be together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This is just a fun little video. As soon as it's done, we'll stand up and greet one another, okay? Uh, so go ahead. Play it. Or work. Team, walk to me. This is crash. This no. is crash. There's one. You'll never make ten. Two. You'll never make crash. One. No. Yeah, I'll count. Three. three you'll three one. Six. You'll yeah. never make ten. Four. <laughs> two. Five. You'll never make ten. Five. <laughs> three. You'll never make six. Yes. It's playing two. Four. four six. six five. Maybe not. Five. Seven. You'll never make ten. Come on. Six. Eight. Six. Maybe not. Two more. She wasn't drinking. I seven. Two more. Nine. Eight. Come on. Then try to walk to me. Ten, walk to me. Two more. Nine. Come on. Then try to walk to me. Ten, walk to me. That's the kind of week we had. I had to give her drama me. <laughs> she threw up three times. Say them shake hands to somebody. Say good morning. God bless you. Thanks for being here. If you're a visitor, thanks for being here. Yeah. And children, come on up for a little bit. second base and they came in third is that right third second all right good job man give him a hand congratulations you'll be signing autographs after the service up front all right water and a rock i appreciate you giving me good clues water and a rock so I'm going to, right away, I'm going to guess that this is when God uh, told Moses to get water from the rock, and Moses was disobedient, and he struck the rock like he should not have, but it gave water for everybody uh, to drink, and somebody did the math on the number of people that would have been there and how many gallons of water they would need to sustain, so that's my first guess. My only second guess would be when they crossed the Jordan, and God told each one of the tribes to take a rock, told the priest from each one of the tribes to take a rock and to make a footpath to pass it, to make that a memorial place. So I'm going with the first one. Moses and the rock that he struck when he shouldn't have hit it. And God said, because he didn't have faith just to say, the Lord's bringing you water. Moses said, how often do we have to do this for you people? You know, he, he took credit. So we'll see if I'm right or wrong. Finally, he gets one right. Finally, he gets one right. 
reason I got it right is because it was you, Jet, and I was tired of you picking on me, okay, buddy? Here. Exodus 17, 6. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. Give him a hand. Good job, buddy. Okay, so again, the sin that Moses committed was not striking the rock in itself. It was striking the rock and taking credit. He said, How, why do I have to do this? Similar words to that. Not saying, look what the Lord has done for you. It, it was him trying to take credit for himself. And that was such a big sin and not giving God credit that God said he could not enter into the promised land. And he led him through the wilderness and had to stop on the mountain. He could see the promised land, but could not enter in because of his disobedience. That's a big deal. Don't ever attribute to yourself what God has done for you, okay? No, just don't do that. All right, uh, who wants to do Little Red next week? Anybody? All right, Tucker, you got it. All right. So the number one question that I got from a couple of these guys, and then several of them know what happened to me, they asked if we saw any snakes. I've got to tell you that some of the youth put Brian, who's in the back, who looks like a teddy bear, but he's actually, I don't he's not a good guy. <laughs> bought a snake in Walmart, a battery-powered cobra, bought it, and uh, placed it in a couple of odd places and had that thing crawl out to me a couple of times. The first time I broke its head off and I thought, that's it, I don't see that thing anymore. He fixed it. <laughs> couldn't fix a van to get all of our youth home, but could fix the snake to continue harassing the preacher. Uh, and then showed it a couple more times. And I thought it was odd that Jason, before he came to our rescue to pick us up, asked a couple times in text, hey man, you seen any snakes? Hey man, you seen any snakes? So I think you had your hand in that as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Jason. We're praying for your salvation as well. Uh, we had a good time though. So you got it next week. Let's have a word of prayer and then you guys can go back to your seat, okay? And then we're going to have a song. Father, thank you for loving us. Good lesson on helping us to trust you. It looked like an impossible situation. People in a desert needing water. It was easy for you to bring water out of a rock. Can't explain it. All we can do is say thank you for your power and your majesty. And God, help us to trust you and also when you do things for us, to give you credit. We didn't do it ourselves. It's not necessarily a doctor or a banker. You meet our needs and we thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, give him a hand. You'll go back to your seat and we'll stand and sing.
Turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading in verse 23, read through verse 31. Uh, for several weeks I preached on the model prayer, and what I want to do this morning is show you, I, I don't know that the word prove to you, but show you uh, that the disciples learned from the model prayer, and we'll see that in the way that they responded to persecution in the church uh, in its infancy. Uh, in chapter 4, while you're turning to, to verse 23, in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says that Peter and John uh, were a part of a miracle. Actually, it's uh, before chapter 4. But they were part of a miracle uh, and that uh, somebody who needed help, somebody who couldn't walk, had their life changed. And after that took place, the priest, the high priest, and some of the uh, religious elites were upset. And they put... Peter and John on trial, uh, and they told them, uh, no matter what you do when you leave here, we don't understand how this man was healed, although for 40 years he couldn't walk. Uh, you're telling us it's in the name of Jesus Christ, and because there's a great crowd of people, we're afraid to whip you or anything like that, but we're commanding you not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. And of course, Peter and uh, John gave a famous answer, is it better for us to obey God or to obey men? And those religious elites knew it was better to obey God. So they had no answer to that. And then they released Peter and John. And Peter and John go back to their friends, the brethren, the brothers. That doesn't mean that there were not women in the area. Don't misunderstand that. But they go back to the believers, the men and the women, and they begin to pray. And what I want to show you in this prayer that they had, and it was a group prayer. I don't know who was audibly speaking out, but the Bible says they began to pray together. So this is the meat of the prayer. I want to show you that in this prayer, we have evidence that Peter and John, who were some of the disciples who asked Jesus, to teach them to pray, who heard Jesus' response and said, pray in this manner, not necessarily these words, but in this manner. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on. Uh, they heard that. They understood that. And it impacted their prayer life. Now this is a very simple application of a biblical principle. It's not the, the same words, but I'm going to show you at least three areas of the model prayer that they involved or had in this response during a time of persecution. And I think it's just a great lesson for us. For one, it should teach us we shouldn't give up in serving God no matter what the opposition. Amen? Uh, and two, understand that God understands what's going on in our lives. And if we'll just trust Him and express that in prayer, express that on a regular basis, it not only pleases God, it helps us and it reassures other people to know that our faith is real. So let's begin. I gave you the background. Uh, chapter 4 of Acts, verse 23. And being let go. Now, I think I'm reading out of the New King James Version this morning. The English Standard Version is going to be on the screen, and that's fine. You'll be able to follow it. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. Now, this is the beauty of this prayer. I, I cannot explain this. There are probably people who have studied this, and they can give you a more accurate answer. I, I can't. 
But when the Bible says that their hearts were in one accord, but they raised their voice, that, that could mean that everybody was praying together and the predominant prayer or the loudest voice or the predominant voice or the one that the Holy Spirit led to be the leader of the prayer said these things. So, or it could just be that their hearts were together, they were praying, but there was one person that was given the responsibility of praying. Now, I like to think that in a moment like this, it may have been Peter. And not for any bad reason, but remember, uh, historically, Peter was the one who would speak out first. And he would speak on the behalf of all the apostles. And several times, Jesus had to correct Peter for his immediate responses. It could be Peter. The Bible doesn't say. And when the Bible's silent about something, I found that it's usually good to remain silent on that. So I don't understand how this prayer took place. But we have the meat of it. Okay? So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Let me show you what we've already just quickly what, what I just read to you. When we're told that we should pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You're a holy God. There's something about you that sets you apart. And just what I've read to you so far, they're fulfilling that portion of that prayer. And they're saying, God, you're holy. And how did they do this? I'm going to go back over this. You can write this down if you want, or I'll, I'll go over it again in just a moment. I'll give it to you clearly. If we're going to go, if we're going to go with hallowed be thy name, what are they saying about God that makes him so holy and sets him apart. In these several verses, they said three things. First, you're the God of creation. You created the heavens and you created the earth. We can't say that about anybody else. That's all your handiwork. He says that in verse 24. Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. You're the God of creation that makes you holy. I may just preach it this way anyway. I don't know. Uh, but then they go on to say, you're also the God of revelation. You are that God. If we're going to say holy is your name, you are that God who revealed to the prophets what you were going to do before it ever took place. There's nobody else that can claim that. God, you spoke to David. God, you spoke to the major prophets in the Old Testament. You spoke in the New Testament and Old Testament combined through John the Baptist. You are that God who has told people ahead of time what is going to happen. And we can trust you. And we can call out and say, you truly are a holy God, what revelation did he give? He told them ahead of time, in your mind's eye, the world will seem like it's falling apart because they're going to take the Son of God himself and they're going to crucify him. It will look like I'm not in control. It will look like the devil is winning. It will appear to you that all of your hopes and all of your dreams are wrapped up in this man, Jesus Christ, and they're all dashed because they take his life from him. That's the way it will appear. I'm revealing that to you ahead of time through the prophet David. So preacher, where did you get it? It's right here. Why did the nations rage in verse 25? Oh, he says in verse 25, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage? So David is writing this long before Jesus is born. And the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his Christ. So long before Jesus makes his appearance, the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, he made some pre-incarnate visits. He wrestled in the Old Testament. We know that. We know that Jesus appeared in different ways. But before he was born as a man in, in Bethlehem to that, that wonderful virgin, before that took place, David said, the world is going to fight against the Lord and against his Christ. That's revelation. Long before you have a bad day, God knows that that day is coming. And he's just as much in control then as he has been all throughout the rest of time. The Bible says here, they're saying, hallowed be your name. You are the God of creation. Hallowed be your name. You're holy. There's nobody like you. You're the God of revelation who told us ahead of time that these things would take place. Then he's also the God who controls every detail of history itself. Not just saying it will take place, but then causing it to happen according to his plan. 
That'll help you wake up tomorrow when you're having a bad day today. Verse 27. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and that includes a lot of people, and the people of Israel, that includes hundreds or maybe thousands of people, were gathered together. So God, we're saying that historically we know you caused this man Herod to exist. You allowed that man to be in a position of power. You caused Pilate to be elevated to a position of authority. And before Jesus was crucified, he stood with that man Pontius Pilate who gave the final authority to say, go ahead and do with him whatever you will. He said, I don't find any fault in him. I wash my hands of this matter, but take him and do what you want. God, you created Herod. You put him in that place of power. Not his dad, not the, the Herod that preceded him, but you did that, God. And you put Pontius Pilate in charge because the Roman government had overtaken all of Israel. You put Pontius Pilate there for that reason, to stand with Jesus the night that he was betrayed. And you gave him the authority to say to the people, take him and do whatever you want. God, you did that. They thought they were just born from a man and a woman. They thought they went to school and learned certain things. They felt like they had elevated themselves to position of power. But God, you did that. They are called kings. They were called leaders because you appoint the kings and the princes throughout all the land, throughout all of history. Then he goes on to say, with the Gentiles, that is the non-Jews, you brought these people that weren't even exposed to the commandments or the law like the Jews were, and you caused them to also hate Jesus Christ. That's part of their DNA. That's part of the way that they were created. They had an enmity for the things of God, and the Jews were able to bring together even the non-Jews to come against Jesus. I'm going to take his life. And they felt like they had all the control. They had the numbers in their favor. They certainly outnumbered the 12 disciples. They outnumbered, outnumbered that one man, Jesus. They knew that if they got a lot of people together, they'd win this battle. And the people of Israel, the Jews who should know better, they were all gathered together. Why did you do that, God? <laughs> Verse 28, the God of history. If we're going to call him holy, we need to know that he controls history. Verse 27, to do whatever your hand and your purpose. You may want to underline those two things. Your hand, that's God's hand, and your purpose, that's God's purpose. Determine before, what is before me? Before Pontius Pilate, before Herod were born, before those Gentiles were born, before the Israelites were created. In fact, the Bible says before the foundation of the world, God knew that he was going to send his son Jesus Christ to die to redeem us from our sins. So he's saying here, it's a mouthful that these disciples are praying. You're a holy God. You are the God of creation. You're the God of revelation. And then when it comes time for things to take place, you're the God of history. You bring all of these things together at just the right time to carry out what your hand wants to do. And your purpose has planned to do and has determined to be done long before we ever thought these things could happen. If that doesn't do something to cause you to trust God, I really have nothing left to put to you. What that does for me is it says, God, before I can engage my little mind or before I can run on my strong emotions and make a decision whether it's good or bad, before I can do anything at all, you assure me in your word before you ever created the earth itself that you knew me and you know exactly what's going to take place in my life. You understood what was good. You understood what was bad. And the moment I began to trust in you, I became a part of your plan, specifically a part of your plan, although he knew I would be long before I was ever born. That will shake your mind up. I understand that. But it causes me to trust him. God, you're the God of history, the God of creation, the God of revelation. You're in control. So when the doctor says something bad with your body or when something happens in your family or when something happens at work, when it seems like, oh, no, I can't believe all this. Like Cammie said something this week and I and I wasn't it was yesterday. I wasn't trying to correct her and to be negative at all. It, that, that's not. And, and I had to explain to her what I meant. Cammie said, boy, the devil sure is wreaking havoc on us right now, isn't he? And I looked at us. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's not look at it that way. Let's look at it as God really is showing his plan and his love for us right now, isn't he? Because no matter what went wrong, God had an answer. Do you see that? If we can begin to look at life that way, 
It helps us in our faith. And I wasn't correcting Cammy in a bad way. She says, well, that's a good way to look at it. I have to look at things that way as a pastor. Not because I'm told to, because I'm a pastor, but because I see so many things happen to so many people's lives and we're all confronted with our own challenges. I have to bring myself to a point that I say, God, this isn't the devil attacking me. It's not evil that is abounding. It is really your grace that is sufficient for every day. And I can trust you in spite of all the evil that the devil intends. Why? Right here. Because you are going to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. God knows where we are. So that means when something bad's happening, God knows what's going on. And we can go to bed that night and we can say, God, I may not have liked the circumstances. I may not have seen this coming. I might not like what's happening now. And I may be a little apprehensive of what's happening and may happen tomorrow. However, how would be thy name you're still god you're still holy and i can trust you if you understand that say amen. amen you see how great god is an infinite god the god that created the universe isn't contained by the universe but created the universe all of the galaxies and he's bigger than all of that and he takes the time to be a part of our little schedules he takes the time to be involved in and to speak to our hearts and to reveal himself in our minds that although we may think we're geniuses, they're just finite minds. And God, the God of the universe, the God who's greater than any single universe, the God of all of creation can be called holy because he's a part of our lives. It doesn't mean you won't be shaken from time to time. It doesn't mean that you won't be nervous and apprehensive about things. It doesn't mean you won't cry because you don't like what's going on or something sad happens and your emotions are, are a part of your life. It doesn't mean any of that. But we can still bring ourselves to a place to say, God, you are God. You are holy. And I'm going to trust you and praise you. So the next thing I want you to see, when the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer goes on, it says, give us this day our daily bread. I want you to see their petition to God. And let me just continue reading. Now, Lord, this is their petition. They just finished with, you're holy. And here's why. Here's their petition. Now, Lord, look on their threats. I underline that word, threats. And grant to your servants that with all boldness, and I underline boldness, and if you want to know, I mean, it's right there in my Bible, I underlined it, okay? You might not be able to see that, but I can see it. Now, Lord, look on their threats, I underline that. Grant to your servants that with all boldness, mark it, they may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So that speaks to me of being consistent with the model prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. So what did they ask God to do when they're saying, God, this is what we need for our daily bread. Now, give us this day our daily bread does not need to be limited to give us a little bit of food. We were at camp this week, and I'll be honest with you. Uh, the one, there's two things I do not like about camp, and, and every year that I've gone, it's been the same. First of all, by the time we get to camp, we go into whatever rooms that they give us, and somebody for eight weeks this year uh, had, had already been in there, and the room already, with the particle boards and with the walls and the, and the mats, already smelled like an old shoe and a dirty sock, okay? Bad. I, every year I buy Febreze and, and I usually buy stick ups and Glade plugins and I, I have them everywhere. And all that does is mask it. It just makes it smell like a, a cinnamon flavored sock or something like that, okay? But it, it's still there. The rooms are nasty. And the other thing that I don't like is the food. I just, I mean, these, the youth are used to cafeteria food. Man, I'm not. You know the hamburger patties that they all come the same and they throw them in and they heat them up and they put them on the same old bun and stuff like that. You know, and the last week of camp is just like the last week of school. You get soup with everything. Okay, so it, I, I don't like the food. So I took the time and I had Brian with me. And let me tell you something. Brian back there in the back is a professional eater. We went to three different restaurants. Three different restaurants. Well, one of them we went twice. No, we did go to three different ones. First, we passed one place that looked like a florist and it's called Julie's. When we were coming back from looking for something that it, one of the youth had lost in, in the river and we couldn't find it. But on the way back, we looked over and it looked like a florist. And, hey, man, now only a professional eater can do this. I think that's a force. And he looks back and says, no, man, I think that's actually a place to eat. Hey, go back. When someone his size says, hey, go back, let's get something to eat, you don't say no. So I turned the truck around and we sat down for a couple hours and we ate a lot. Had a good time. The next day, we made sure we went by the burger, burger shack and got us a hamburger. And now he had two burgers that day. I'm telling you, he's a professional eater. And then another day, we took the youth out and we ate at the Mexican restaurant and just had a great time. I don't like cafeteria food. Can't stand any of that. But when we pray, God, give us this day our daily bread, it's bigger than going to Julie's, 
or going out to a burger shack or going to a Mexican restaurant. It's not just food. Some days, my daily bread might look like, God, I really need some emotional help. A lot of things on my mind, a lot of things happening. Uh, I'm concerned or I'm overwhelmed. I'm worried. And if I'm worried, God, it, the Bible says, don't worry, take it to God. So what I need to do in obedience is if I'm worried, I go to God and say, now, God, here's my daily bread. This is what I need. I am anxious or I am worried. And in order to be an obedient Christian, I'm bringing that anxiety, I'm bringing my worries to you. Give me whatever I need to make it through this situation. It might be it's a spiritual thing. God, right now I'm having a difficult time trusting you. I'm having a difficult time seeing who you are. Uh, the circumstances of life have kind of bothered me. And spiritually, I'm not where I need to be. So God, spiritually, give me that daily bread. Draw me closer to you. It could be financial. God, you understand that the IRS has found me once again. And here I am owing them. And Lord, oh, all these penalties and fees. I am in some deep camps. You know, that's just rotten cabbage and making career. Don't go too far with it, okay? I'm in some serial trouble. I need help financially. It could be I'm losing my job. It might be that somebody has been diagnosed with something physical or medical in your life. And God, my daily bread today is meet this need, whatever it may be. Or just remind me that your grace is sufficient. And I'm going to get through this. That's the daily bread that I need today. So what did the disciples ask for? They said three things. And it was very specific to me. It's very specific based on this passage of Scripture. I, I don't want to read all the verses over and over, but I think it's important to do it. Verse 29. 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats. Consider what the, the world is doing against me today. Let that be my daily bread. Reassure me that you know of all the bad things that are happening. Just, just in my heart, speak to me and let me know that you're aware of the fact that the devil is plotting against me or that the world is working against whatever I'm trying to do to serve you faith. Whatever your life is, whatever is going on in your life, when the devil, as Cam said, begins to attack, then say, God, I want you to be aware of the fact that these things are going on. Just let me know that you're aware of it. And that'll do a lot for me. Then let me know that you still care. Uh, sometimes we get overwhelmed. Sometimes our emotions get the better of us. And we come to a point where we say things like this. I don't even know if God's there. I pray and I don't even know if God hears my prayers. So it might be that when you say, give me this day my daily bread, it might be that you say, God, just let me know that you're aware of what's happening in my life. Consider their threats and let me know you haven't abandoned me. And then they go on to say this, and this is, I think is a beautiful prayer. Give us boldness. Let me be bold in the face of opposition. Let me stand up when the trials of life are overwhelming. Help me to be strong when I don't hear what I want to hear. Help me, God, to handle the failures that happen in a world full of sin. Help me to be strong when it looks like the world itself is chaotic and out of control and I don't know that I can do anything about it. God, in moments like that, help me to stand up and to be bold and to do what a godly man, a godly woman, a godly child should do. When the world is beginning to uh, oppress us, when the government is coming against us here, when the spiritual leaders say, don't go out and say another word. God, you know what they want to do to us. You know what the devil wants us to stop doing? You know what my emotions dictate from time to time? But right now my daily bread is, I need you to help me to be bold. Whatever that means in your life. Help me to stand up and do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because it's the accepted thing. Help me to stand up and to love and to perform Christian things, not because somebody's going to reward me or recognize me, but that's what you expect me to do. Help me to be bold in the way that I live my life. Don't let me be a timid or a meek or a weak Christian. Don't let me be a secret service agent. God, help me to be outgoing and forward with my faith, although it's difficult today. Young people, not just because I spent a week at camp, but I'm still young enough to know your hearts. It's tough being a Christian. Very difficult to be a Christian outside of your home when you feel safe, when mom and dad and brothers and sisters accept you. But when you go to school, and I know Green Sea Floyds is an exception in so many ways. When you go to school or when you go to work, when you're with your peers, it's not always easy to be a Christian. Pray that God gives you boldness. You don't have to be a rude jerk, but you can be a strong witness. If you get that, say amen. All the people, it doesn't get any easier, does it? Of course not. 
Teenagers, you think you're the only ones that have a problem being bold? You, you think that parents and adults always speak their mind and say exactly what they should say and, and they never have a moment of hesitancy? I'll tell you, in my own life, I've had to pray for boldness more often than not. One of the things that Claire said to me this week and a lot of the other youth, we just don't know when to take you serious. I'm like, well, I'm serious in the pulpit. And then I had to back up and say, I mean, sometimes. <laughs> I look at you and tell you when I'm serious. And then I said, well, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm just saying that. But there's some times that I know I have to be serious. And I have to say things that are difficult. I have to make decisions that are not easy. In my life, personally, in the life of the church, it's moments like that that I feel like the disciples, when they're praying here and all of the believers, give me today, right now, my daily bread, and God, let that daily bread be part of making me a bold witness for you. Let me move on before I put you all to sleep. If we're going to pray, God, give us a stay our daily bread, part of that request might be, verse 30, by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Maybe your daily bread today is, God, I need healing. Oh, and I mean, let's be specific. Maybe you need healing physically. Something's happening to your body and you know it. Maybe you don't know what it is. I don't mean just aging. I mean something's happening to your body, young or old. You know it. And you're asking God to heal you. Our God can do that. Amen? Amen? Amen. I believe that. I truly do. Look, there's no telling what you might have going on in your life. We have to be willing to say, God, part of my daily bread today right now is restore this aspect of my health. Give me the ability to walk. Give me the ability to use my hands. God, don't let arthritis overwhelm me today. God, give me healing from whatever it is the doctors are saying could be wrong with me. God, give me physical healing, whatever that need is. Don't be afraid to go to the God that created you, the God that knows you. And as the Bible says, who knows every single hair on your head. For some of you, it's a little easier for God to number those hairs. It's easier for me. You understand what I'm saying? God knows all of those details. And we can say, God, you know my body. You know what's going on. You know what's going on with my friend who's in the hospital right now. You know what's going on with Alan. You know how his face is busted up. God, you know what's going on with Judy's husband. You know what's happening with his body and how they've said there's something wrong with his heart. God, you understand what's going on with Caitlin and all the things that are going on with her body. Lord, you understand what's happening with some of our church members that are on our prayer list and some who have given requests that are private and they don't want everybody to know. Lord, you understand all of those details. And right now, we're coming to you and saying, God, give us this day right now our daily bread. You can heal us if you choose to. And we've got that kind of faith. But God, if you choose not to, you're still holy and you're still on the throne. Amen? Amen. That's a mature prayer. Sometimes that prayer needs to be repeated often in our lives. And I want you to see the last part of it. And I had to write these out so I don't forget them. They were affected by the response of God. This is where the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, goes on to say, To thine be the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. How does God reveal in this prayer that this, this is going to be His kingdom? His power is revealed. His glory is worth praising forever and ever. Well, listen to what the Bible says. It said in verse 30, by stretching out your hand to heal and, the, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, so that means when they got to the Amen. In a Baptist church, that means when the last person grabbed their purse or grabbed their coat and began to walk out. And when they had prayed, at that moment when they thought that everything was over, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. I marked these words in my Bible. You don't have to. It was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, the multitude of those, this is verse 32, I know it's not on the screen. The multitude of those who had believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed were his own, but they all had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Miracles continued. So this is how God revealed his kingdom, his power, and his glory. Four things. The building shook. They knew God was real and they knew he was present. Sometimes God needs to shake us. Don't know how he'll do it. 
It may be something just like this. Where you're standing at that moment, you're overwhelmed with the presence of God and you begin to shake and tremble because you know he's alive. It may be that you're alone, you're having a quiet moment of prayer and you're overwhelmed with the circumstances of life and God just speaks to you in a way that only he can. And you begin to tremble inside and you know that God's present. Can't explain that, but if you ever experience it, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we all need another dose of God just telling us, I'm here. The building shook, the spirit filled them. And for us, that means today that at that moment, they're reminded that God is in control and he begins to work through them. And the believers spoke exactly what God wanted them to speak. We can go out and do exactly what God wants us to do. When we remember that this is going to be his kingdom, he has all the power and he's worthy of all glory. And we begin to act like he's God and we're his children and we do what he wants us to do. Then we begin to speak and to do exactly what God wants. And the things that happen through us are nothing less than miraculous. Here, the believers spoke. Why does that seem like such a big deal? They were just told, if you continue to speak in the name of Jesus, we will punish you. And they threatened it with many threats. It means we will imprison you. We could take your life. And eventually they did. But they were so consumed with the idea that God is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever, that they did not care what happened to them in this temporary world. They were more concerned about what happened to them for an eternity. So they spoke in spite of all the threats. Do you see how the disciples learned the model prayer? And the miracles continued. The sign of a healthy believer is that they still believe in their heart no matter what's going on, God can fix this. A very mature believer is one who says, if God doesn't fix it the way that I want it fixed, he's still God, and I'm still one of his children, and I'm going to trust him. Amen? Amen. Well, let's dismiss in prayer. Father, I don't know what the world has in store for us the next moment, the next week. Unfortunately, occasionally, I'm still in the habit of checking the news, and I know that we're being threatened by other countries. I realize that financially we're not where we want to be. We have a lot of concerns. Oh, but Father, you are still God. You're still on the throne. You still love us. And Lord, as I wish I would have mentioned more specifically last week when you passed under that tree, you knew Zacchaeus' name. You see us and you know us. You know our names. Help us, God, to know you in the same way that we see you, we know you're in our hearts, we know your name, we understand that you call us by name, you call us your children, your sheep, and you are our shepherd. And right now, God, whatever the need, whatever the fear, help us to be reminded of exactly what the apostles did. When the world is opposing us, when everything in life seems to be going wrong, your grace is still sufficient. And we can cry out and say, our Father, who is still in heaven, hallowed be your name you are our god you will give us our daily bread you'll help us to forgive others of their sins as you forgive us of ours lord and we thank you and god we can walk out of this sanctuary knowing that this building is just that a building but we are the church and you're filling us you're speaking to us and we can reveal to the world as we trust in you confidently thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Holly? Let's stand. If you need to pray, whatever you need, you come and talk to the Holy God. Let him meet that need. This altar's open. When the best of me is barely breathing. Maybe you need to pray this morning for somebody else. When I'm else. not somebody. 